So we're um, five past our start time and we have uh, over 100 people here, which is very exciting. Welcome everybody uh, to the first installment of Hyperscience Learn 2021. Um, I'm Sarah, brand marketing manager based out of uh, New York City. Really excited to have everybody here. Um, and we're really excited to uh, have these monthly installments for you. And part of the, the reason why we're doing it is because we want it to be led by you and have your feedback on topics that um, you would like to learn more about and you would like to uh, just get more insights on. So after Evo presents, um, I'll be sending out a feedback survey for you to kind of dictate um, any ideas or initiatives or comments that you have as we continue um, doing this uh, monthly. But uh, without further ado, uh, Evo, go ahead and kick it off. Hello, everybody. I am very excited to give the first lecture of the next installment of Hyperscience Learn. So today I'm going to be talking about machine learning one-on-one, -on -one, um, which is pretty much I'm going to be covering the past, the present, and the future of machine learning. And this is in short our agenda. I'm going to give a short welcome and explain what is the, going to be the structure of Hyperscience One. I'm going to briefly tell the, the, the most boring part of the presentation about myself. And then um, I'm going to explain why we're talking about this, a bit about the history of machine learning, how it evolved, how we came to be here where we are, and then what happens nowadays and what we can expect from the future. So first of all, welcome to Hyperscience World. Um, what is the goal of the program? Well, we are all um, very excited to be working in the field of machine learning and we find it very um, intriguing and um, playing around with these models, with uh, these uh, new concepts and uh, the knowledge around machine learning is um, very motivating to us and we would like to share this passion with you and so somewhat help you grow as machine learning enthusiasts or maybe hear what you have to say to, to us so we can kind of also learn things from you. And um, in general, we would like to support the community, grow it and um, help people onboard being machine learning scientists or uh, to help people know each other. Um, what you, can you expect? Actually, the, the schedule is fixed for the first few lectures. So you can see here what are going to be the first three topics. The first one I'm already started about the past, present, and future of machine learning. And then we're going to have two sessions around uh, the, the very first steps in machine learning. How do we train a model? Uh, but actually, our lectures will be based on PyTorch, one of the um, more popular machine learning frameworks. So the first lecture will be focusing around what are the steps in order to train a model. And uh, then we're going to have a, a next lecture that is uh, focused around how do we evaluate this model? And how do we make sure that it does uh, solve the job uh, is set in form? Um, the lectures are going to be monthly. And um, the future agendas are actually going to be driven by you. Um, we really uh, very much appreciate the feedback that we hope you're going to give us after each lecture. And we are really going to read them through and uh, figure out what is going to be interesting to you and try to adapt to that. Um, and who is the, the program meant for? So we are targeting several different groups, like uh, ML specialists. Maybe some of the lectures will be too basic for you. But there will be also some um, more in-depth and more interesting uh, topics coming uh, up your way later on in the seminars. We're also targeting machine learning students. And like um, likewise, you probably will have some machine learning context. But uh, again, I hope each of the lectures will also contain some interesting uh, topics or things that you have not heard. So um, things that are new to you. And also people that are software engineers with no ML expertise and they would like to kind of start onboarding and start learning about machine learning. Um, and as I said, the most boring topic who I am, uh, I'm Ivo, or Ivo Strangev is my whole name. I graduated master's in artificial intelligence from Sofia University, I think nine years ago now. I'm teaching assistant in Sofia University occasionally since 2007, so many years now. I have completed two internships in Google Zurich, and before joining Hyperscience, I worked four years in VMware Bulgaria. So I have uh, enterprise big scale computing experience as well. I'm uh, still one of my hobbies is to participate in computer programming competitions, and I have participated in both computer programming and mathematical competitions since uh, 1998. So 
very, very long time ago. Um, I have been part of hyperscience for five, more than five years now, so February 2016. And a very important disclaimer, I always mention in these lectures, I have an identical twin. So if you ever happen to come to the beautiful city of Sofia and see me on the streets, you wave to me and I don't say, hi, there's a good chance that it's not me. You just think I know you. So th this, is, uh, this has caused a lot of confusion over the years, so I always uh, want the people I'm talking to. So that's me in a nutshell. Now, um, let's talk about the actual topic of today's um, lecture. Um, of course, people, like all the professions, people have different perspectives of what uh, they think you do and so on. So you've probably seen many, many versions of this. So uh, when I tell people that I'm working machine learning or artificial intelligence, they imagine I'm trying to take over the world, like, of course, destroy everybody uh, and, and the world. So you can see the Terminator uh, reference here. Some other people, they think that I'm connecting brains to the computer. <laughs> so, or computer scientists often think that machine learning scientists are um, pals with money and so on. <laughs> of course, mathematicians thinks that, uh, think that we are <laughs> very basic beings that are just uh, tapping keyboard uh, randomly, hoping that something comes out of it. I, of course, think of myself as a very smart guy. Uh, but in fact, what we mostly do is uh, we take existing components and we connect them in an, another way. So, of course, we all the models that we have in hyperscience are homegrown. We build them uh, on ourselves. But the basic building blocks are actually present in the uh, popular machine learning frameworks. Uh, during these lectures, we'll be using one of the popular frameworks, as I mentioned, PyTorch. Um, and many of the examples that we'll be using is ba are based on that. And I'd like for, uh, to start off like we're teaching you the ve a very simple AI. So what does this AI do? It reads an input number and it tells you whether it is an even or an odd number. And that's it, a very basic thing. Um, actually, there, there may be synthetic error or whatever, but it, that's the, the basic idea of it. And I just want to explain the fact that uh, the fact that everybody is doing AI. Because by definition, AI is giving the computer the ability to make a decision on their own. And it, it could be a pre-programmed decision, like a basic statement in this case, or it could be something more complex. So um, although the term intelligence is uh, quite vague and not well defined, in theory, every single computer program that I've seen or I've written over the years is considered AI. That is one of the reasons many companies these days, they claim that they have an AI department. Well, yeah, all of your development departments are AI departments. Um, and in, in theory, a, any decision, even the simplest decision of them all, is again an uh, intelligent decision. So it is making a, for instance, in this case, it is discerning between odd and uh, even numbers. And um, yeah, of course, AI is a field in computer science. It is very trendy and so on. So everybody wants to be in AI. So what I just explained is that, well, everything is AI. Now, what is machine learning? Machine learning is a subfield of AI. And the main difference between it and the, the broader term AI is that in machine learning, we're teaching the, the computer to, to make uh, decisions without being explicitly programmed about those decisions. In the example that I show you, the, we explicitly programmed uh, what is an odd and what is an even number, and that was programmed within the if statement. Well, in machine learning, we the machine should be able to handle examples that the, it has not been explicitly told. And um, yeah, most of the development in AI in recent years is focused in machine learning because it's, of course, um, more scalable. Uh, you cannot teach a program to do um, to, 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 to have seen all the examples and so on. Of course, that doesn't mean that no simple programming is ha uh, uh, happening or no explicit truth programming is happening. It's just that machine learning is by far more scalable and that's, uh, that's why it attracts more um, interest this year. Um, and what is deep learning? Deep learning in itself is a subfield of machine learning and it is uh, specifically concerned with uh, training artificial neural networks. So it's uh, mostly around neural networks. The term, I was a bit surprised that it was introduced in 1986 um, and the interest spiked uh, somewhere around uh, 2012, actually in September 2012, when Alex Zinsky um, introduced 
uh, novel network he called AlexNet. And it was used to solve um, the challenge called ImageNet. We'll be do dealing with it actually in uh, later lectures when uh, it, I'm sure that this particular data set, this particular challenge will be coming up more often in other lectures as well. But um, the idea was that this was one of the first architectures that were a bit deeper, like a neural network architecture that is a bit deeper and is able to handle this challenge, which is about uh, image classification. Um, and it actually introduced a significant uh, improvement over the state of the art results that used to be before it, it was introduced. Okay, so this is a bit of the history of uh, machine learning. So, um, actually not ordered in uh, chronological order, sorry for uh, swapping the first two. So the, the first neural network machine uh, called SNARK was introduced by Marvin Minsky in uh, 1973. Um, and its basic building block is actually the perceptron and it was invented in 1957 by Frank Rosenbaum. So it is interesting that many of these things were invented but uh, Back then, the machines were not powerful enough, or we did not have capacity to, in order to make full use of them. Um, in 1980, the neural tron was introduced, and it is um, kind of a predecessor of the convolutional neural network. Um, so you can see that's about 41 years now ago. Recruit neural networks were uh, popularized by John Hopfield in 1982. So again, about 40 years ago. Um, 1986, the most popular uh, technique of optimizing neural networks was introduced, backpropagation. Um, and it was uh, first described in 1986 by David uh, Rumohar, Geoff Hin uh, Jeff Jeffrey Hinton, and Ronald J. J. Williams. The, in 1995, uh, one of the most basic, um, most foundational algorithms in what I call traditional machine learning was uh, discovered. This is about vector machines. Uh, it actually, it was one of the dominant ways uh, machine learning was, used to be done for quite some time. Uh, 1997, uh, Seth Hotschreiter and uh, Jürgen Schmiederhuber discovered a long short term memory, which is a specific type of cell which is used in recurrent neural networks. Actually, uh, we'll be dealing with most of these things, maybe not with neurocognitive, but with it. Uh, Successor the convolutional neural networks in the following lectures. So we will have a lecture about in recurrent neural. As I said, yeah, of course the agenda will be driven by you, but we have planned to have lectures about recurrent neural networks, about uh, convolutional neural networks, and so on. Um, and machine learning cannot be thought of as just like what are the model architectures and what are the different approaches we are using. Uh, Undivisible part of it is also what are the data sets and the databases we have in order to train these data sets. In 1973, pretty much the data set that was using was a single photo called Lena. <laughs> like this is a, a, a very popular photo that used to be um, kind of a benchmark for uh, image compression. And many image processing algorithms were using just this photo to, to see how they're doing. Um, <laughs> so yes, one example back in 1973. In 1991, there was the uh, a, a later data set, a data set called letter, um, and it uh, just consists of printed letters, and it had about twenty thousand uh, examples. Um, one of the most uh, important data sets for NLP for natural language processing, the Pentry Bank projects, uh, was created in nineteen ninety five. It contains about uh, one million words. And uh, there's text that is part in semantic trees. So these are structures that not only care about what are the words, but what is their meaning, their semantics in the sentence. Um, and this is, uh, this is not only used for machine learning, by the way, it's also used for uh, linguistic projects and so on. Uh, 1998, one of the most pop uh, popular data sets was created, MNIST, so it is uh, handwritten digits. And it consists about uh, 60,000 examples, pretty much on every machine learning course where you would attend. One of the first exercises would be to train a model that predicts in this data set. It's like, um, I don't know, camel world of machine learning. Uh, 2001, Caltech uh, 101, uh, it is a data set used for object recognition. And there we have about 10,000 examples. And the object outlines are marked on this data set. So it's not only 
um, for instance, classification of surface, but also where the object is located on the image. In 2010, Pascal Vogt, uh, it is uh, the data set where you have labeled, image with, uh, labeled images with bounding boxes. Um, and 2014, ImageNet. Uh, this is a data set I already alluded to. So this is a labeled image um, of objects. So we have uh, 50, about 15 million examples. In it, we have 1,000 classes and of them. So these are classes of things that are in the image. And of these 1,000 classes, we have 200 that are of different breeds of dogs. So the idea is that uh, the people that are trying to solve the problem, they can not only discern between the vastly different objects, but they can also discern by mostly uh, closely related objects, so different breeds of uh, dogs. For instance, there's the Alaskan Malamut and the Husky, which are pretty similar breeds, but a good classifier should be able to, just uh, looking at the image, to be able to say that this is a Husky or this is a uh, Malamut. So as you see, this is actually pretty, pretty fast um, growth in the size of, sizes of the data sets and also in the complexity of the problems we are trying to solve. For instance, uh, just a character uh, handwritten digit classification is much simpler problem than object um, auto recognition. And uh, data sets, of course, are growing uh, much bigger. And I want to tell you a, a little bit about the human. And this is a rough estimate. Uh, Pro probably this is uh, based on, I don't know, my, some assumptions, but let's say it's roughly correct. So a two year old, um, let's assume they're, they're awake for 16 hours if their parents are not very lucky. So a two year old would see about uh, 2 billion images in these two years. Um, and assuming someone is talking <laughs> to the child at an average speed of 150 words per minute, not sure if that's too fast or slow, but let's say uh, that's about right. So the, the child will hear roughly 10, uh, 100 million words in that time, in these two years. Um, and it is important that the child has a lot of context. It combines the input from multiple sensory perceptions. So um, what it feels, what it hears, what it smells, um, and uh, so on, and what it sees, of course. Mm, so a lot of information combined. Uh, and uh, the child's brain is able to combine all these uh, sources of data and words. So that's why children actually well, really fast. Um, it, well, it is a disclaimer here that the, the data that the child sees is usually very correlated. So it's not 2 billion uncorrelated images. It's typically uh, one frame at a time, but the frames are very related. For instance, you're watching at me and I'm waving at you. So two separate frames are still me, just my hand is moving. But still, it's so a lot of data. As, as you saw, uh, even some of the bigger data sets that we have have uh, 15 million examples, and here are two year old, or this is two billion images, um, several orders of magnitude more. And uh, as I said, we have a lot of context. So, me and you looking at this photo that is really, really bad quality, um, we still can, can say, huh, yeah, I have seen photos like this. So, mm, it looks like a road, there are some trees in the back. So, most probably that's a race car. Um, and there's a driver driving the race car and so on. So having this uh, more context, we can be better than a machine. Well, it turns out that's not always helps, uh, but in this particular case, this is a photo of a race table. <laughs> Actually, it's a fun story. I can put uh, here the, the link, but this is the guy that broke the, the land speed record for a table, for a dinner table, moving for with a few hundred miles per hour. But anyways, what I wanted to point out is that uh, so our context, of course, can sometimes hurt uh, what, what we predict or what we expect. But most of the time, our, uh, the context that we have from our previous experiences, what we've seen and so on, from the world and what typically happens, what typically moves on the road, help us to recognize what, what is uh, on a photo. And um, a computer vision algorithm cannot have this context. They, a computer vision algorithm has only seen the data that you've shown while you trained. And so, um, it cannot make this logical uh, conclusion as we do. I want to tell you a, a little bit about the early history of, of machine learning. So, <laughs> yeah, there's this famous quote that uh, 640 kilobytes uh, ought to be enough memory for everybody. Um, and this is kind of a similar thing about uh, computer vision. There was this uh, summer project, uh, summer intern project that was meant uh, to happen in 1966. 
about uh, let's let's create a um, simple algorithm that just classifies images. Um, and that's it. Let's have one or two interns and they'll solve this problem. And that's it. Let's go home happy. Um, it turns out it was not that easy. <laughs> um, so there was a huge hype in the 80s to the mid 90s. Like, whoa, machine learning, neural networks, let's do it. Um, and most of the algorithms, as I showed you in the timeline, they were invented back then. Um, but it turned out that the problem is not that easy. It, and mostly, uh, in my opinion, it was due to two reasons. There was not enough training data. As I showed you, the sizes of the data sets back then were much, much smaller than what we have now. And then the compute power was significantly uh, less than what we have nowadays. Like uh, my smartphone that is here next to me, it has the computing power probably of all the computers combined back then, or several orders of magnitude more than that. So for a while after that, there was a kind of a dark ages for specifically for deep learning. So neural networks, things based on neural networks. And they were using it more um, uh, what I call legacy type of machine learning. So support vector machines, principal component analysis, and so on. And of course, there, there should be a punchline to our story. Otherwise, it wouldn't be interesting, and I wouldn't be telling it to you. Then two things happened, and they changed the status quo. They changed uh, what is happening in the machine learning world. The first one is the internet. And it actually made a ton of difference. Here on this table, I've presented some data about what, is, what was the internet traffic over the years. So starting in 1990, uh, about, and this is petabytes per month, by the way. So about 1,000 petabyte was the fixed internet traffic in 1990. And it grew like um, quite fast, almost exponentially. The latest data I could find is 2017. So this is actually based on um, a report that Cisco publishes each year. Uh, unfortunately, and it, it is also reflected in Wikipedia. Uh, unfortunately, I, it seems to me that the reports uh, from 2018 and later, they do not in include this data. There's a, there was predicted, uh, what are the predicted values for 2018 and so on, but there was no actual measured data. So, but uh, the expectation is that the, the amount of data is still growing. So, uh, uh, of course, um, as you see, initially there was no mobile internet and uh, starting in 2005, it starts catching up and it's catch catching up really fast. And actually the expectation is that at some point it could even surpass the fixed internet traffic. But um, yeah, this amount of data is enormous. Each month now we have way more data than overall in the world than like say uh, 20 years ago or even less than 20 years ago. So that was the, mm, first thing that is really a big game changer. So now that we have internet, we have all this traffic, we have all the data that we need, petabytes and petabytes of data. And the second thing, uh, we have better graphics cards. Actually, uh, using GPUs, we have way uh, better compute power. Uh, GPU is very well suited for arithmetics with uh, matrices. And most of the machine learning is based on arithmetic with matrices. For this reason, the graphics cards actually um, make those uh, computations faster, more efficient. And uh, so graphics cards actually help uh, training a especially uh, complex and uh, deep network much faster. And yeah, of course you thought uh, computer games are not good for anything. Well, they are good for something. They introduce better graphics cards that uh, actually made machine learning better. And now, we, nowadays we even have TPO, which is tensor processing unit. And this is dedicated processing units specifically for machine learning. And it, is, it was created in, with the thought with about uh, Google's machine learning framework that's called TensorFlow. Um, but it is, um, the way it is constructed is uh, optimizing some of the um, specific multiplications that are uh, operations or multiplications that uh, happen in machine learning in, in, in general, it, it can give a pretty good and solid speed up. Well, of course, in order to make use of this speed up, your architecture and your model should be uh, constructed in a way that it makes use of it. Like if you just to do the something stupid, of course it will not help you. It, it, it is true for everything. And now, do you know this person or this person? 
they're quite famous, you know. Um, so then, what about him? Uh, I believe most of you recall who they are, but looking at Google Trends, it seems that AI rocks more than them. So AI rocks more than Metallica, and ironically, AI rocks more, even more than The Rock. And it is the fact that uh, AI is getting more and more popular, and it is kind of a, many people say that AI is the new fuel. So as long as you have data and as, uh, you can train an AI to optimize pretty much anything. And um, that is great, in my opinion. And um, I would like to tell you a um, hmm, horror story, maybe not a horror story, but definitely a story that has a morale uh, for it. So it is kind of an outdated now, it happened in 2016, but anyways, I'm going to tell you about it. So this is a technology called the Temporary Current Optimal Running. And what is it? It was introduced by a company called Rocket AI um, on the uh, one of the biggest machine learning conferences. Back then, the name of the conference was NIPS. After that, it was rebranded and its current name is New Rips. But anyways, it is one of the biggest uh, um, machine learning conferences and it's specialized uh, around uh, neural networks. It was a mysterious patent pending technology that was introduced in their web website in this uh, conference. Um, and uh, one, the founder, Dr. Sandberg, uh, gave a speech um, at the party about a very exciting new technology. And there was also a lunch party about this. Uh, actually, there was a police fine as well because it turns out they, made, they were making too much noise, so the police in, in, interrupted the party and, and they fined them. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, they, this was a technology introduced in the new, uh, NIPS 2016. And it, uh, looking at the comments from uh, people, it uh, turns out it can do many things. So these are all very, very famous uh, machine learning scientists. So Ian Goodfellow um, posted about it, Andre Karpati, um, so quite famous people. So it turns out that um, it has the, uh, this technology has the most popular Jacobian optimized kernel expansion in this conference. The best party of the conference was also awarded to Rocket AI and Andre Karpati recommended that we should be watching the company closely and so on. It actually picked up quite attraction. So everybody was uh, retweeting about it, uh, liking the comments, uh, commenting about it. And of course, the more attention the technology attracts, the more uh, investment it also attracts. So um, what is it actually? It's a joke. <laughs> the whole technology is a joke. And these are several, the, the name of the technology is just a kind of a, a combination of several buzzwords and the abbreviation is actually abbreviating troll. Um, the whole thing costed about $80, 79 to be more precise and about $400 for the alcohol and snacks and the lunch party and including the police fine. Um, and for this time, which is uh, the order of days, the estimated value of the company was tens of millions and uh, five major venture capitalist funds reached out uh, interest about investing in the company. The, the community, they got the job because it's like just random buzzwords that didn't make any sense and the, the speech uh, that they gave, it was total like random words without any sense. And, uh, but the community spread the joke uh, further um, on Quora, Twitter, Reddit, Crunchbase and so on. You can actually see that some of the tweets, for instance, Young Goodfellow's tweet, about definitely has, having the most popular Jacobian optimized kernel. It's actually abbreviating joke. And you can see that in other um, of the tweets as well. Um, and they even created a t-shirt about it. So <laughs> I think they're out of it by now, by the way, but uh, they even made some money out, uh, out of the whole, the whole thing. But uh, you can literally take a throwing t-shirt about people that are over happy with AI. Um, and I just want to tell you why I believe this story is important. So yes, AI is trendy um, and it, it has great potential to change practically everything. As I said, if you have enough data, you can build an architecture, throw, throw the data, the, train the architecture and solve pretty much any problem. But we, we should not be overhyping. As, as I said, in this case, tens of millions would have been invested in just uh, thin air, nothing. Literally nothing is behind it. 
but it, it just so happens and I, I see it uh, more and more these days a company just says um, I don't McDonald's we now do AI um, think, name you name it any any sort of company they just need to do to, to say they're doing AI or machine learning and suddenly the interest in them grows uh, significantly oh wow they're doing something very fancy at the end of the day as I said first of all everything is AI um, and second of all doing machine learning is not always the best solution and uh, the, the fact that they say that they're doing machine learning doesn't mean that it actually is helping in any way or in this case it, it could even be a joke so as everything it shouldn't be overhyped and it, uh, we should take it seriously and we should like be, for my advice to you before acquiring any company because I know all of you are planning to acquire a company in the next month before acquiring any company that claims to do machine learning just take uh, some time and check whether they're really doing something useful and also something that I've noticed uh, uh, around like people that like playing with machine learning they tend to do like they this um, I have a hammer so everything that I see looks like nails to me so uh, a friend of mine he uh, was very excited and wanted to show me his machine learning he built that was its purpose was the following you feed it an image and the machine learning predicts what is the most popular color in this image like which pixel color is the most popular in this image and yeah, uh, you could do it, but um, why? Like you just iterate over the pixels of the image and you know which is the most popular color. And this would be far more efficient and absolutely certain algorithm. So there are problems that need to be solved with machine learning and there are problems that are not fit to be solved with machine learning. Okay. Now, I want to, to tell you a little bit about neural networks so that uh, people don't think that we are actually connecting brains to networks. Actually, some people do, but we are not. <laughs> Machine learning scientists, most of the time, they don't do that. Um, and before doing that, I would like to, to tell you that many of the things that uh, machine learning is doing are based on what we've observed from actual human bodies and what happens, not only human bodies, by the way, animal bodies, and what happens in them. Um, and this here is biological structure of actual neuron. The one that uh, this structure happens in uh, appears in many animals, in human included. So um, a typical neuron would have a cell body. It will have dendrites, which are used to connect to other neurons. It has an axon, which is this uh, long tail, and it has terminal bulbs. These terminal bulbs are usually connected to the dendrites of other uh, neurons. I really hope there's not a biologic spe specialist among you because otherwise I think I'm saying stupid things, but they're most, mostly related to what is the reality. And it is, um, I guess, enough in order to understand what is the intuition between the equivalent, the artificial uh, neuron that is the basic building structure of neural networks. And this is the perceptron. I'm not sure why it's spelling connected to perception, but yeah, this is a perceptron. So what, what is it? It's actually kind of a mathematical function that does uh, the following. It takes its input, uh, some numbers, which are x1, x2, and so on, uh, to xn on this image. It multiplies them by some weights. So, uh, and uh, it sums them, and it apples the sum. And it does something that we call a step function, which is a bit, uh, mm, Maybe um, too, too complex to, to dive into uh, in this lecture. It will be covered in the next one. But um, in, in short, this is the equivalent of uh, the dendrites. This is the accent here, and th this is the connection to the other neurons. So we have inputs. It, you can think here, each of these dendrites is multiplying an input from a uh, near neighboring neuron by something. So for instance, here, you typically in your body, what runs is electrical impulses. So an electrical impulse is fed to the body of the uh, neuron. It does some processing. And at the end of the day, it outputs just a single uh, electric impulse that is fed to other uh, neurons thanks to these terminal bulbs. And this is the basic building block of uh, neural networks. It's again, taking some inputs, multiplying them by something, which is happening in the dendrites, and then outputting, an, uh, well, it's in this case, a number that is equivalent to the electric impulse. That's some, somewhat smashed here in the step function, which is also a called activation function. And it is then propagated to other neurons. So you can, in a typical neural network, um, I'll sh show a typical neural network a bit later. In a typical neural network, you have this uh, link to many, many neurons on many, many layers. So you have uh, a huge network of these neurons. 
that end up to be the architecture view model. Um, and there have been some uh, experiments to, to prove that this basic structure of neuron is actually able to, to do um, all the calculations that we need. For instance, in our bodies, our neurons are somewhat mutually, um, you, you can replace one neuron with another and start, it starts performing the same uh, task. For instance, a, a subject can be told to see with that tongue. So this is an uh, experiment where they, they were attaching electrons, uh, electrodes to the tongue of a person and they cannot see but with using these electrodes they actually want to see a very vague image so they can so it's kind of hard to say that it is seeing but they can see uh, they can understand outlines of things surrounding them and this is a real product now i i put here links to all these things so that you can uh, read about them um a subject can be taught to see with their ears so in this case they're um, projecting sound in their ears and they they can understand uh, what is happening around them so uh, a little bit like bats, for instance, but uh, still, you, um, in, in this case, neurons that are meant to be used uh, to understand hearing, they, they can be meant, to, they can be rewired or uh, repurposed uh, so that you understand the surroundings around you, and uh, you can start at least rough out, uh, understand at least rough outlines and um, distance information, so on. And um, the subject can be taught to hear with a tongue, similarly to seeing. So all this. Um, Experiments uh, tend to, to prove that uh, pretty much the same neurons can be used to do different tasks. And that's what inspires the fact that we try to use the same structure of an artificial neuron to solve different uh, problems. They have been, by the way, um, in order to, to do many of the experiments around machine learning, there have been some partially gross experiments. For instance, um, one of the experiments that drove the development of convolutional neural networks by Hugo Vessel. <laughs> involved a sedated cat where they uh, actually had electrodes tried, um, directly wired into its brain and trying to measure the, the excitement of this uh, particular section of its brain. Um, so it, it was quite, they, they got a Nobel prize by the way, later for that. I, I think I'm going to be speaking about that in a later lecture, a bit more about these experiments, but yeah, that people and scientists were trying to understand how our bodies work so that we can uh, kind of rep, um, replicated in our artificial neural networks and the way we uh, do a machine learning. So this is a multi-layer perceptron that I mentioned in the, um, a little bit before. So imagine that each of these uh, circles here is the equivalent of the image that I showed you. So uh, each of these um, circles, it takes input from all the, the circles on the previous layer. It does uh, its computation. So it, it actually sums them up with a given weight and bias. And it outputs uh, a neuron, so it, it outputs, uh, sorry, it uh, outputs a number, uh, which is equivalent to the um, electrical impulse that a real ne neuron will do. And you can imagine that we can do that with uh, many, many layers. So typically, uh, this is what is called a fully connected layer. So in a fully connected layer, you have uh, a set of neurons and you have the next layer again a set of neurons and each neuron on the previous layer is connected to each neuron on the next one so you can see here you have pretty much the output here is replicated so the exact same number is fed to all the neurons on the next layer and this is multi-layer network where you have one input layer this is the input that is fed to our model and you have two hidden layers. The hidden layers are the ones that are neither on the uh, very beginning or the very end of the network and you have a single output layer. Um, and uh, there's a, a theorem called the universal approximation theorem that claims that um, this uh, approach, so using a hidden layer, we can approximate um, arbitrarily accurately any, any function. Um, and it is kind of, it, it tells us that using this representation, we can pretty much implement any sort of function so we can learn anything. The problem is that the proof is not constructive. And for this reason, although we know that the, uh, a, such an architecture exists, we don't know how to construct it. And so uh, the topo topology of the network is unknown and we don't know what are the parameters of the network. But yeah, we can solve any problem pretty much in short, we can solve any problem using neural networks. We just don't know how, so we need to experiment. And of course, neural networks went deeper. Uh, this is Google the net. 
uh, one of the networks introduced in order to, again, to, to say, solve ImageNet challenge. Um, and here you can see, I, I cannot count them that fast, of course, but let's say a few dozens of layers. Um, each of these uh, small rectangles here is a whole layer. Um, so it is either a convolution neuron, uh, either a convolutional layer or some other um, layer, or there's an activation function. But in, in general, this involves um, dozens of layers of this. So dozens of such layers. Probably about uh, probably more than a hundred, but I don't I didn't count them. Um, and it goes even deeper. Um, and by the way, these are uh, both architectures that won the ImageNet challenge at some point. I believe this happened in 2016. Um, this I, I don't remember the exact year. Um, and Inception uh, ResNet version two uh, has de uh, been developed, I believe, in 2016. It has 164 layers, each layer itself containing a lot of neurons and so on. It has 55 million parameters. Um, it introduces some uh, innovations, of course, and it, uh, in particular the, the ResNet, the abbreviation ResNet means residual network, and the, its innovation, like of the first ResNet, was the the introduction of the so-called residual links. These are links that are just uh, skipping over part of the architecture. So this one here. I'll dig deeper into that uh, into in a later lecture. Actually, I really like playing with this architecture. It, it looks very scary, very big, very complex, and so on. But it is um, great to play around. And um, I typically give this lecture playing with image models, so unfolding image models and visualizing parts of them. And I, uh, in this lecture, I try to also so show the source code of this uh, network because it seems really scary here, but the source code is really not that complex to understand what is going on. But um, yeah, this is a very deep architecture. As you can imagine, as it has 55 million parameters, it takes quite a while to run it, to teach it. So it uh, makes a, a lot of iterations over the training set and it uh, requires a lot of uh, compute. And 20 years ago, that was not possible. Um, okay, going after that, um, what happens with AI in the news? Of course, it's a trendy topic. Many uh, uh, news channels are trying to cover uh, what, what is going on with AI, with machine learning, and so on. My concern is that there are a lot of um, articles that go out there, and they're written by people that don't really understand what what is uh, what is going on or they're just uh, trying to seek out uh, some sort of sens uh, sensational news. And for this reason, they try to make uh, things more scary or just uh, straight away uh, invent things that are not facts. Um, so here I just collected uh, several of them. The, for instance, the uh, a news topic claimed that uh, the Google's new AI has one to become highly aggressive in stressful situation. Uh, I read this top, uh, article, by the way, that um, I actually, I might be confusing it with another one of the here, but um, the idea was that uh, you're given a game where you can either go um, and pick up a reward or you can kill your opponents and then pick up all the rewards. And basic, uh, based on different parameters of the game, yeah, the AI was warning that killing all the opponents and then